iNabber has put out a 80-page Google Doc in response to his ex-girlfriend's allegations. If you're not caught up, iNabber's ex, Cursed, put out a statement on Twitter alleging a whole bunch of different things against him, basically saying he was a toxic partner. iNabber made a Google Doc in response to this, which I covered on my channel here. Then Cursed made a 31-page Google Doc in response to this, which I covered here. And now finally, we have iNabber's 80-page Google Doc in response response to where he completely dismantles all of the things that Kirst alleges in her documents, basically just ripping it to shreds. And I know I've been relatively unbiased in my coverage, just covering the facts and reading the documents, but this document is an absolute destruction. As a reminder, everything in these documents are all just allegations, and please do not harass anyone involved, and there will be timestamped chapters in the video for different sections of the document. But let's just go ahead and start. It starts off with Fraser saying, Responding to Kirsty's horrific lies. Kirst has posted another thread of information about me, which is horrific manipulations of the truth designed to ruin my life. Today, I'm going to be responding to every single thing she said in that document and disproving all of it. I genuinely am so disgusted by some of the things she said, and I genuinely just want this to be over. Please share this around to anyone you see calling me an abuser because of Kirsty's lies. But please don't harass anyone mentioned. Now I feel like I should address the most serious allegation first in this document, and the main one being sexual coercion. The Kenji part of this will be the final thing I cover, scroll to the end, due to the amount of screenshots given. Attachments to the original lies I have disproved, and then he links his other documents. Then he goes to the sexual coercion chapter where he starts off saying, Now I believe I have been accused of this mainly due to the fact that I showed a screenshot in my previous response showing evidence of Kirsty trying to coerce me into sex, see below. And then he shows that one where she's asking about her weight that we read before. Now I mentioned in my previous document how horrifically uncomfortable this made me, and I find this argument from Kirsty quite unsettling considering how large reason our relationship deteriorated was the fact that I did not have sex with her for large periods of time, especially towards the ending, due to the fact that I was going through extremely depressive periods in my life. Then he links Kirsty's statement where she alleges that it happened multiple times on holiday, and he says, Now personally, this statement is just absolutely wild to me, as the evidence she has attached comes from something completely different to what we were talking about. And then he attaches the text Kirsty put in her document, along with these ones. Now in these screenshots, she is suggesting this because I said, let's fuck in the sauna. After this, we went to a sauna and chilled there for around an hour, and had an argument because I wanted to stay in the sauna longer than our allocated time in the sauna. And it led to an argument because Kirsty did not want to do that. We kissed lots in the sauna but did not have sex in there. I'm not dumb. I know there was cameras in that spa and would not have tried to have sex in there despite making jokes about it. Me and her regularly made jokes about having sex in public spaces, but we never actually did, as you will see in a screenshot ahead of this. The reason I didn't want to leave is because we had paid a large chunk of money and received an entire swimming pool and spa area to ourselves for an hour, and I wanted to stay for longer. A big arguing point in my relationship with Curse was about being on time to things and leaving things on time. Sounds weird, but it was something we always disagreed on, and this was one of those times. We did leave on the agreed time, but it led to an argument because of this, and mainly due to the fact that we had been arguing quite a bit in this week, so there was some tension. Proof coming soon. But in terms of Kirstie's proof, it's just me saying, let's fuck in the spa, which is absolutely insane. We literally had an argument, and I needed space. Mainly because at this point, we were having quite large arguments. I could say the same thing as her. She was pressuring me here. Screenshot below. And then he links a screenshot where it starts off with him saying, Yes, to be honest. She says, I hate you. He says, I think that might be a lie. She says, proof. He says, the begging me to fuck you part might be proof. She says, proof of this. He says, well, I didn't have proof, but it definitely happened. She says, lies. I can't believe I was on top of you, completely naked, begging you to fuck me, and you didn't. He says, I was tired. Shut up. It was like 5 a.m. and we had been in the club for four hours. She says, I think we are thinking of different times. What part of this DM doesn't seem like her pressuring me into sex? This was one of the first of February 2022. Now I should just say, I don't believe Kirsty was actually malicious here. This was just playful relationship stuff from her IMO. But obviously I could spin this in anything. I have felt pressure from Kirst with sex at times. Particularly with the original document screenshots about her speaking about breakup sex. But why I'm showing this is how easy it would be to manipulate screenshots like she is doing. I do believe what she is trying to do by using the spa situation here is her trying to spin the screenshots from my original document which shows her making me feel under pressure when asking about why we haven't had breakup sex and using weight as a way to manipulate me into this. She didn't apologize for this behavior. 
She simply spun the truth into another disgusting accusation and said this. And then he shows a part of the document where she's talking about Fraser handpicking moments without context. And he continues, above is a screenshot from her document that states, I was using screenshots from where she was in an unstable place mentally, but I don't think that proves her point in any way. The behavior she displayed to me was not acceptable. And it's disgusting she has tried to flip it onto me. Even with her spa message, I have messages of her saying, let's climb a mountain and you can fuck me at the top. Is this proof she pressured me into sex? No. It's just a fun sexual suggestion that most people make in relationships. Silly sexual fantasies. Then he links text proof of what he said. Now going back to the reference to the arguments we were having at the time. The argument I'm posting below was on the 11th of February, a few days before. And then he shows text messages where Kirsty says, I'm sorry, but you made me feel extremely shit and I just want space. Carmen sent him my way. I didn't reach out to him. Fraser responds, I understand you want space, but this just seems like a complete miscommunication. I'm not blaming you. It's my fault. But I just need to talk to you about it calmly and not over text where it seems way worse than it actually is. She says, miscommunication or not right now, I want space. He says, okay, I'm sorry that I made it come off like I was blaming you. I really didn't mean that. And with the door slamming sh shut stuff, I don't know what that was about, so I didn't mean to slam anything. I was frustrated by you not replying, but that was it. I'm really sorry. Take all the space you need, but please speak to me soon. In person. Haha. -ha. Now, this argument was about a miscommunication, as you can see below, when I'm speaking about this one with one of my best friends at the time. And then he links text with a friend where he says, we have worked it out, that this was the stupidest argument, and we both misunderstood everything. And now she's dying of laughter. She thought the complete wrong thing. The friend responds, I'm glad to hear it, man. Hope you guys have a good night and a great holiday. And he says, thanks, man. Literally every part of this argument was like a misunderstanding. She thought why I went into my room and played loud music, stropping. I was doing yoga and dumbbell curls. This is so funny. And this is referencing something that Curse said in her first document in regards to him sending her to go buy sheets and he wanted to record and then it just didn't work out. Things were pretty tense in these few days and I had a lot on my mind. Hence, when we argued on holiday, I decided to leave her to get some space as she literally refers to in these texts and needing space when we previously argued. Then he links a text where Kirsty says, I'm sorry, but you've made me feel extremely shit and I just want space for a bit. Carmen sent him my way. I didn't reach out. He continues, because of this, at this time, I took the mentality of leaving Kirsty to have space when we had arguments. And on holiday, we were on a one-room hotel, and the only option was to go for a walk after we argued about leaving the spa. Hence, I said this in her screenshot. And then he shows the screenshot where he's talking about leaving during their argument that Kirsty linked. As you can see in these screenshots, I say I was literally leaving to make her feel comfortable, as even a few days before she left to get space. She even says in the screenshot she doesn't understand why I did this. So I think it's fair to say that this is an outright lie and a fabrication of the truth. I am genuinely disgusted she would spin this lie about her sex life and just to such a disgusting accusation. Especially considering the fact I didn't want to have sex, it became such an issue in the relationship. Take this screenshot from July 2022, for example. And then he links screenshots where he says, are you excited to go gym with me next week? And she responds, you're telling me it's super frustrating and it actually upsets me that we don't actually have a sex life at the moment. Like, it's not everything in a relationship, but for me, it's important. And I know it's not my fault, but I'm really hard on myself because it's my body that is stopping it. And are you actually going to go with me? He continues, It was a clear issue from the screenshot mentioned in my original document and this one, that my lack of desire to have sex was a problem throughout the relationship. I am genuinely so unbelievably shocked she has tried to spin this. A simple argument about timing that became more heated from tension at the time from shown arguments into such a disgusting allegation. But Kirsty is obviously not shy from trying to manipulate people into thinking bad about me. And then he links the physical implications tweet. For example, saying here that there were physical implications. A tweet referring to a relationship that actually had physical implications, I'm Alex, which caused people to speculate I was physically abusive to Kirsty. And this tweet got 64,000 views with no deletion. And then he shows her follow-up tweet clarifying it. Her follow-up tweet clarifying on this after being called out on it got 6,994 views, a very much smaller amount in comparison. And now people think I physically hurt her due to her manipulation of the truth. The tweet above also directly contradicts the allegation made in the statement surrounding coercion. Then he shows a part of Kirst's document where she says, When her hour was up at the spa, I said we needed to go as they come and get you. But Fraser was begging me and rubbing my legs, saying we should have some more fun. He continues, Here she states I started rubbing her legs and begging her. This which suggests I put my hands on her in an uncomfortable way. Yet in her tweet, she says I did not physically touch her. I think all of this very much proves Kirsty has manipulated an argument into a horrific allegation and shows that she absolutely cannot be trusted. This is the second document I'm disproving her with. It is continuous and utter lies. And then he continues on to the confinement chapter. Now this is an allegation I addressed in the previous document too and something I genuinely cannot believe is even real. This is one of the wildest manipulations of the truth I have ever seen. 
She is trying to paint me out to be a supervillain who has locked her up in her room. For context, this is the basis of what Kirst says. And then he links the part of the document where she alleges this against him. Now, Kirst isn't wrong on one thing here. I'm very uneasy with recording when people are around. And I did ask her to either be quiet or do something like walk the dog when she was. But the only time I ever left her for five hours, which she references, was I believe from this screenshot here. And then he links a screenshot from August 2022 where Kirst says, What's going on? He replies, What do you mean? She says, It's been hours. He replies, Oh, what? I finished ages ago. She says, What the fuck? You didn't tell me. I've been sit here like a lemon. He says, sorry, I just kind of thought you'd guess via the silence. She replies, it's been silent the whole time. And he continues his document saying, now whilst this was an error on my half for not coming in and telling her that I finished recording, as you can tell from the tone of these messages, it was not some wild malicious confinement. It was just a sticky situation where Kirsty was living in a very small flat after I moved her in to get her out of a tough spot. It was always going to be a difficult situation living together from the beginning due to the fact that our flat was so small. We had a bedroom and the other bedroom was converted into an office and then the kitchen was mixed with the front room. There really was not much space and this led to tension. She even uses an argument here where she suggests I'm gaslighting her for slamming two doors and then shows text messages from cursed documents where she alleges that against him and he's basically saying what slamming the doors come on. As you may have guessed, this is an argument I actually showed previously where I provided screenshots above when speaking to a friend about this argument at the time, which is exactly what I interpreted. This was the very moment of speaking to my friend about what was going on and how I was so confused about it at the time, mainly due to the fact it would all being down to a miscommunication. And the screenshots below is the beginning of the conversation when I address this. Then he shows text messages from February 2022, where he says, Well, I just really upset Kirsty. I am an idiot. Lol. Didn't even mean to. I'm so bad at texting shit. Someone says, it's okay. I just went and walked her back. He responds, thanks for speaking to her. This person says, she seems to be okay now. He responds, it was an argument after such a dumb thing. Of course it would be YouTube related. This person asks if Fraser is okay. And Fraser says, not really, but whatever. Just feel bad for her. Then they say, we didn't actually speak about it at all because I think she needed to take her mind off of it. And then Fraser responds, it was just miscommunication, mate. Then he continues his document saying, as you can see in these DMs, I was regretful about how this was handled, but you can blatantly see that this was a miscommunication. My friend went and spoke to her to make sure she was okay, and as you saw in the DMs above, we ended up laughing about the whole thing. It was a tense argument, and from this moment, I learned that giving Kirsty space when she needed it, after an argument, was important. Hence, on holiday, I left to give her space, even though she said I didn't need to. Then he shows two screenshots that Kirst included in her documents, where she attempts to use these texts as proof that he was overly aggressive about his private time recording. And he continues saying, she uses these screenshots for farther proof. On the first image on the left, I admitted in my first document if Kirst was home, I would ask her to be quiet and try not to make noise as it was a tiny apartment and the microphone would pick these things up. It was an unfortunate situation, but Kirst was a full-time student living in my place. And the way I paid the bills was via making YouTube videos. This is a manipulative spin on things. We were in a difficult situation when I tried to make her safe by getting her out of an abusive household, and this was one of the consequences. Me once or twice a week for an hour or so asking her to be quiet. If I didn't do this, I wouldn't have the bills to pay. Then he links a tweet from 2022 where Curse tweeted out, To think this time last year I was receiving daily phone calls from the police, women's aid, and uni to check that my male housemate hadn't punched me or tried to kill me that day and that I was safe. This week I graduated and am about to head home to Christmas with my boyfriend. Then he continues saying this is a very sensitive situation for her and I understand, that being her previous household before me. But this is proof this was why I moved her in. I didn't want her to be in an abusive household. And we regularly spoke about how there would be some issues with recordings as I have anxiety surrounding that. But this wasn't anything negative at the time, and Kirst was usually always understanding. I get that it was frustrating for her, but this is a wild spin. Then he links to the other message that he referenced earlier, and says, This here isn't about recording, but this is referring to when she was interrupting me on a video game and I was telling her to stop. As you can see, she used a meme format. This was a lighthearted joke at the time. Not sure why this has to be included. Then he includes the next section, which is chaptered as wait, and says, I genuinely don't even know what to say here, really. This is just a bizarre claim. Saying to me that I don't find fa fat people attractive and that I would break up with her if she gained too much weight. This is genuinely a really confusing claim to make, especially considering it's well documented I have my weight issues and have spoken about them lots on my social media. The comments about her eating also make no sense considering she tweets literally acknowledging I was basically a chef for her. Then shows a tweet where she says, 
I got a boyfriend and a personal chef in one from July 27, 2022. He continues saying, and this is true. I would cook for a lot for Kirsty and made sure she ate good meals and ate regularly. These are more baseless accusations designed to defame me and make me look terrible. I have multiple instances of providing Kurtz with food and zero negative comments about it below. Then he shows text where he starts off with him saying, poor Kenji. She responds, hello, this is my NATO's order. Normal chicken wrap, set of corn, five wings, I'm in the bath. You're sincerely a spoiled brat. He orders it. She is excited about it. And then he says it's on a plate and she's just thanking him. Then he shows more messages where she says, when was that? He responds, about an hour ago. I'll bring you it in a minute. Would you like any food? She says, I don't know what we got. He says, yogurt and fruit? She says, I'm just going to go to the toilet. He says, wait, just got to record an audio clip. She says, we don't have much fruit at the moment, I don't think. Okay, it'll only take a second. Then more messages where she says, by the way, I can't have the banana bread as it's made with nuts at Starbucks, but thank you. He replies, oh, for fuck's sake. I thought you'd like it. I didn't know it had nuts. My secret assassination attempt failed. She says, I do love banana bread, so if you don't know they make it with nuts, you would have come back to a corpse. He says, yeah, I know, haha. And then she says, Kenji is losing so much hair. Then he shows more where he says, and my head was on him. She responds, I haven't eaten today. He says, and I had drooled everywhere. She says, gross, I'm starving. And he says, we will get you food. Then he says, as you can see, I actually have proof showing that I would always be willing and wanting to bring her food with no negative connotations. And when searching quotes of what she said, nothing comes up. Then he looked up, already eat today with nothing. Doesn't look healthy. You want to be eating that? All with nothing. Once again, this is more fabrication of the truth. Literally everything she has said in this part has no screenshots to back it. And in the Instagram story she posts referencing, I guess me not finding fat people attractive, comes after our breakup, when she was posting very negative lies about me on her TikTok regularly. And then he goes to the next section, which is mental health. In this section, Kirsty says this, and then he references a part of her document where she talks about her depression and how Fraser was not supportive, allegedly. Now, basically what's accused here is she moved in and everything went terrible when it literally isn't true. The problem was our living situation was very difficult, and it was hard living in a workspace and a living space with two people and a dog. She even says in the DM below that how she's feeling isn't because of me, and he shows a DM where Kirsty says, Honestly, I don't like how messy my room gets when I have people stay because it feels so cramped. I do just need to exist in my space with my things because I'm feeling super lost right now and I want to reconnect with who I am. How I'm feeling hasn't got anything to do with you or us. If you don't have depression, then you can never understand what it's like. I do just need my safe space with all the things, really, and comfort. Although I'm really grateful for all you do and for welcoming me into yours, I do feel like an imposter when I'm at yours for long periods of time. The space is yours and will always be yours because you've been there for so long. Like how you get a wardrobe for me but didn't even ask me if I liked it. When I asked if I could put my vines up when I moved in, you seemed uncomfortable with it. The flat is yours and will always be predominantly yours, which is completely fine. But knowing that, I do just need to spend time in my space. I also don't have any friends in London. Currently, there is nothing for me there but you, whereas I still have a life in Nottingham. I'm missing out on so much. I miss my friends and they've said how much they miss me. It's nice to be wanted by people, you know? The biggest thing is I just can't keep trying to put on a brave face because I'm constantly finding myself irritated. I've been sleeping so much because I'm so exhausted from fighting off my own brain. And it's nice knowing I can do that without that feeling of guilt that I'm letting you down. Trying to dismiss my depression is only making it worse and I can't just ignore it anymore. He continues his document saying, basically as you can see it was a very tough time for her. She was in a place that wasn't good for her because she'd moved to London where she knew nobody and also felt like the place she was in wasn't hers, which was understandable. But it wasn't like I was receptive or accommodating to these issues, as you can see here. Then he shows text messages where he says, I'm genuinely really sorry for making you feel like this isn't your own place. I'm just repeating what I said in that audio message. And I think it mainly comes down to that I am quite an overthinker and defensive person. As you can see from this, you're dealing with your own issues, nothing related to me. And I've just made it seem like I'm making it about myself because of overthinking, so I think it's something I personally need to work on. When it comes to actually making you feel like this is your home, we can do that. And funnily enough, I am actually completely rearranging my place right now to make it homely, which is kind of ironic. I was then putting a bookcase in my room because I know you like that stuff and was even putting a vine thing on it because you said you like them for fuck's sake. But I'll cancel the wardrobe tonight if you want, of course, and you can find stuff you want. Send it to me and we can get it. But literally the other day, I was looking at office spaces. And that's because I was planning on making my office not an office, but a homely-ish room that you could use and maybe do your work in over the summer, etc. Like, I'm really sorry I've not made it seem homely, but I'm trying and it's just something I need to work on. When it comes to friends and stuff in London, I think it's something over time that you'll develop. And I know you said you don't want me to pay for things. I want to pay for you to do poll stuff here so you can continue doing that stuff and just feel more yourself. Take all the time you need and I'm really sorry for being an idiot. 
I hope you know you mean the absolute world to me. Then he continues in his document saying, I was seriously trying my best at this time to make things better for her. It was seriously a tough moment and I really was doing everything I could to help. And in terms of actual referencing her depression, this is what I said after she moved in. Showing a text where he says, Yeah, of course. For me, it's just about learning that, to be honest. Because I don't have depression and I haven't really experienced it, what it's like, or how it affects you personally. So I'll just try my best to be more understanding and not get worried. It's something that I've done, etc. You take all the time you need to yourself, though. Even if it's a while, if it helps you feel better, then I'm absolutely fine just waiting to see you. If it means you start to feel more yourself. If there's anything I can do to help, though, be sure to ask. Ha 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 ha, I won't get a shit mirror. You just need to pick one, so go on Wayfair or any other website tonight and find a good one. I'll send you a kinge in the post to make you feel better. Then he continues, I seriously don't understand how this could be construed into a way she has in her document, accusing me of some of the things she did with no proof. Kersey, as she said, was dealing with a lot, and it was not because of me. Then he attaches the text messages where she's talking about her depression that we read earlier, and he says, this tells a completely different story to what was referenced in the document. There were days where we had plans, and those plans were canceled due to Kirstie having a day where she could not get out of bed, and I never berated her for these things and only tried to help. This comes into the next part of where she speaks about therapy. As throughout the entire relationship, we did speak about therapy, and I offered to pay for it every time, but Kirstie turned it down every time. Then Fraser shows a tweet that Kirstie made on April 6, 2022, where she says, it's night like these and I'm so grateful for my boyfriend because if I didn't have him, I would have nothing. He continues saying, but bearing in mind, this was also after she had moved in and things like this were available on her public Twitter. Yes, realizing things weren't actually the way you perceive them to be originally is a thing, but the evidence I have shown is overwhelming and that she has manipulated and lied about every other thing. I don't doubt Kirsty deals with a lot and I will never take that away from her, but I always did my best to support her. Hence, I never put pressure on her to ever pay for anything or do anything. In times, I would try to gently suggest things that might help, going for a walk with me, etc., but never anything that just wasn't me generally trying to help. I don't deny Kirsty was going through things, and dealing with Kinji in the enclosed environments we were in was extremely stressful, but I was as supportive as I could have possibly been in every situation, even to the point of where we moved out into a three-bedroom apartment just so she could have more space and she could hopefully start feeling better. But some of Kirsty's own words contradict herself here. As you can see here, it says this, and then he links a part where she says being with him felt like she was trapped and that she tried to break up with him multiple times and he never changed. Then he continues saying, she's claiming pretty much every single time she would try to break up with me, it was like she was trapped. Yet before that, she said I was the one threatening to break up with her. Then links a part where she says in March 2023 that he threatened to leave her if she didn't go to therapy and get on medication. Now, of course, these are different dates, but these things really don't make much sense to me. Now, yes, there are moments in the relationship that we almost broke up, but we spoke about these things and things got better after working on things. Hence, statements like this. Then he shows tweets from November 2022, where Kirst says, I'm starting to find my footing in life again, and I'm getting so many more boosts of productivity. It's so nice to finally feel like I'm alive again, lol. And another one from April 2022, where she says, It's nice like these, and I'm so grateful for my boyfriend, because if I didn't have him, I would have, like, nothing. And one from May 2022, where she says, I want to wake up Frey, because even though he is right next to me, I miss him. Then he continues saying, Of course, these don't represent the overall happiness in our relationship, but we had bad moments and good moments like all relationships. I'd say the closest we genuinely came to breaking up to properly before we did was in October, and we worked on things, and despite Kirstie saying things never improved, she admitted in text that I used in my previous response to that not being the case. And then he links text that we have read in the first Fraser document where she is talking about all the nice times that they had together, and also talking about how she really just wishes that they could talk about it and get back together. He continues, this is her trying to convince me to get back with her shortly after we broke up in 2023, trying to convince me of all the good times we had in the last few months months and that obviously everything backslided into a horrific incident. The truth is, I did regularly suggest a therapy to Kirsty, but I did not say I would break up with her if she didn't get therapy, as Kirsty refused therapy and I did not break up with her. She broke up with me. It makes no logical sense to claim in March 2023 20 that I would break up with her if she didn't get therapy slash medicated, when nothing came from that. We broke up because she broke up for me, showing this is a lie. But also the idea of being trapped after she broke up with me, she put so much pressure on me to get back with her. I felt so unbelievably trapped by her in this breakup, which is pretty ironic considering her claims. Then he shows text messages, which we looked at in his very first document, and more which we have read in his first document. And then the one where she's talking about nice times, where he just showed earlier. And he says, as you can see, there was a lot of pressure on me in this breakup, and I felt very trapped given our living situation. Of course, I understand it to be a very difficult time, as there was nothing more I could do than allow Kirstie to live with me, until she could financially afford to move out. 
but messages like this regularly put me under so much pressure and gave me the feeling of being trapped. Then he again shows the text messages where he offered to pay for her rent and continues, even when offering to pay for her to have her own place and be away from me, she turned it down. I offered her a way out where I would be the guarantor, so I legally have to pay for her rent, and she turned these things down. If anyone was trapped in this situation, it was me. He then continues saying, in terms of these screenshots here in October 2023, she refers to wanting to end herself in a text, where she then shows these messages, where she said that it was gaslighting. Now, with the context of this argument is me getting very annoyed with Kirstie as she started posting about my friends on her social media. And whilst at this point, Kirstie had been posting about me in a negative way every now and again. But this was way too far for me as she was attacking people who did not even know her. Before I show screenshots though, I should just say the reference to wanting to end themselves to me wasn't an admission of an attempt that had she had made. It was just I thought a throwaway comment to describe her feeling really shit, which is something me and Kirsty both do. Then he shows texts where he proves this. I'm lost. Where's the barbers? Guess I'm just gonna end myself. We already ordered food. I literally just got my water. I swear I'm gonna end myself. I miss you. Kenny seems calm. I want to end myself. Why is it so loud? I actually want to end myself. What's up? Vegas crashed. Now, obviously, I'm not dumb. I know Kirstie was struggling. But based on what she was saying in that message to me, it isn't her telling me that she tried to take her own life. And based on all the messages before of Kirstie saying how much she wants to fix things and how much she loves me, I really can't take this and say I am the reason for her doing this. I do not think it's fair. What happened with Kenji was absolutely terrible. But this is not fair. And then he shows a message where he says, this is the DM that that argument stemmed from. And the DM is him saying to Kirsty, hey, I don't appreciate you making TikToks shitting on me. In the past, you've told me that you don't post about me, yet you so obviously do. You've also sent me plenty of texts about being fine with people coming over. And I also don't appreciate a TikTok about a friend who wasn't even wearing my jumper and wearing her own. You live in this flat with me. You complain about me 24 seven and I don't expect to get on. But the behavior of accusing me of sleeping with someone when it's honestly none of your business is just outrageous. I would never sleep with someone when you're here. I've had friends stay, found plenty before, but now you're just not publicly slating me, but slating my friends. I don't appreciate it. And I don't think it's fair. I'm trying my best to support you and help you. I said to you in August I feel uncomfortable bringing people over, and this is exactly why. What if I do start dating someone in the next month? Are they meant to be publicly barraged to? Not fair on my friends, especially not fair on a friend who I've hung out with plenty of times and who is watching a movie with me. I shouldn't have to explain my friendships or relationships, and this is just unbelievably unfair and wrong. He continues saying, I was very angry at her, and personally, I think rightfully so. As you can see, I'm referencing her accusing me of sleeping with someone in the flats when she was there and slating friends who had no idea who she really even was. This made me feel even more trapped. I seriously did not know what to do with this situation despite being told in the past by Kirsty that she was actually okay with me getting into a new relationship. And then he shows text where Kirsty says, Fraser, please know that if you want people around you, you can do that, so it's not going to be weird. If you want to get into a relationship, it's not going to be a bother to me. I'm speaking to people, and the fact that I live with my ex doesn't hinder that at all. And more where she says, Fraser, I don't tweet about you. Stop making out I'm slagging you off online when I'm not. I do care about your mental well-being, but you have to understand I'm doing all that I can right now. And then he continues, as you can imagine, things were getting even more stressful from here because I started having other people around. At the time, just friends, and it led to horrible arguments with Kirstie, which admittedly were very blunt for me and possibly out of context could seem nasty. But this was because I was feeling trapped. I was dealing with sexual pressure a few months prior, consistent begging of me to take her back, telling me it would be okay for me to see other people, and then after I did this, she told me that she was actually not comfortable with this. This was an extremely mentally draining situation to be in. But let's address the DMs below. Then he shows the DMs where she's talking about, hey, don't talk to me, we broke up, like, I don't need painful reminders. And he says, now, Kirsty has taken things out of context here. In the top DM, she has, to me, based on her wording, made it look like I DM'd her and she was trying to get me to stop. But it was her double messaging me. And then he shows more context to the messages that she cut out, where she says, OMG, no way. I don't follow her, so I literally had no idea. And then some time later says the message that we've already seen. And then he responds with what we've already read. And she says, I appreciate that, but I don't need to be reminded of that. You don't love me anymore randomly every day because I'm going through stuff too. And then he responds, I don't really know how we avoid all contact when you're living over in that place though. He continues in his document. Now, obviously she is doing what she said and asking me to stop talking to her. But to say I was constantly texting her is just such a lie. No, yes, I did try and speak to her. But the reason for that is that we were living together and I wanted to make things easy on both of us. I wanted to try and make a difficult living situation a little better without us having to constantly fight and argue. There is really no easy way around any of this. It's a bit of an impossible breakup. I personally thought trying to be friendly would be the best way to navigate this awkward living situation. And yeah, I was wrong in that. Then he continues saying, let's address this. 
talking about the allegations of her doing things to herself and Fraser walking in and, I guess, implied that he was being creepy. He says, honestly, this is a bit of a confusing thing to read. Here it would have been a simple situation of me knocking on her door and asking her to come in to either get something that needed to be washed up. I probably made two trips in to pick things up. Either that or that I was looking for the remotes to control the electronic blinds. This was nothing malicious, and I'm not really even sure why it was mentioned. To me, this is just a lie about an innocent situation. Then he shows text from September where he says, hi, where is the remote for the blinds? She says, um, does Aiden want to stay in my bed? He replies, nah, it's fine. I just need the remote. She says, I'm not going to be back as we're all staying at Meg's. So if he wants a bed, he's welcome to it. It's in my room somewhere. I can never remember where I've put it. Just thinking he might be more comfy in a bed than that sofa. He continues, these DMs here show that the remote being in her room was a regular issue, but also shows that in September we were friendly enough where she would suggest that my friends could not only stay in her room, but also stay in her bed. I really don't think this would be the case if things were as hostile as she has described them. To me personally, with me and Cursed, we weren't exactly on the best of terms, but up until around October time, we were still having open communication. Like this, it was relatively friendly. And then he shows friendly text messages where they're just talking about like his keys and other things like that, where she even puts X at the end of her messages. And that screenshot, she offers to buy Kenji something from the shop and even offers to walk him. It's very clear that we were on good terms. But the reality is that things started getting a much more hostile after I started inviting a woman friend over to hang out. It was noticeable how hostile things were after that. And these screenshots, I think, prove that. Because there had to be a reason it went from a relatively civil environment of even her offering to walk Kenji to massive arguments that I showed previously. Then he shows a part of the document that Kirst made where she talks about being so uncomfortable she had to go outside. And he says, she says here that she was so uncomfortable with me that she would stay out until late walking around. This was on the 8th of September. But to me, this doesn't make sense as referring to a screenshot from earlier, only two days after this, she randomly offered to let one of my best friends sleep in her bedroom whilst she was away. Now, yes, she wasn't there, but surely if she was so uncomfortable, she would not be willing to be so nice and offer such a kind gesture. It makes no sense showing what he sent earlier about Aiden staying in her bed. Whilst it was an uncomfortable environment to live in together at the time, this is an unfair spin on things. And then he continues with finances. In this part, we're going to go through a large amount of manipulation of the truth. The first part being cursed having 12000 in the bank when we first met and having nothing left. Now, I can absolutely claim I am not responsible for this. Kirsty spent her money in the ways she wanted to. I never made her pay rents, bills, or anything. It was just me happily paying for everything, and to this day, I consider that fine. She didn't have a job and was trying to finish her degree. I wanted her to be as comfortable as possible. Kirsty did make big purchases throughout the relationship. For example, she bought an iMac, which cost a big chunk, and also would just spend money on clothes and other things. This is none of my business, and she can spend her hard-earned money however she likes. To help Kirst earn money, I offered her little jobs, working for me, where she would do research and cut up podcasts. And I would pay her a good amount for this. Typically, I pay my researchers, I believe at the time, 20 to 22 pounds an hour, and bonuses dependent on the urgency of the research. And in terms of pay, I was very kind. I regularly paid in advance for work she hadn't even done yet. Then he sends messages where he says I can pay in advance to help and other messages where she says, I still owe you a podcast as you paid me in advance for it, and I just haven't been able to do it as I work a physically demanding job whilst being ill. And more where she says, I haven't yet, only heard about it this morning. OMG, thank you, I just noticed you paid me in advance for two podcasts. That was super kind, thank you so much. And then he links receipts showing that he paid cursed. And more here, and more, and even more, and the last one here. As you can see from my bank transfers, I did my best to support Kirstie financially on a job that did not require much stress, neither did I put pressure on her to do. I also found evidence to prove even more lies. Then he shows a part of the document where she somewhat alleges that he kind of pushed her away from working a real job. Here she is basically saying that she only quit her job because she was worried that we would break up, and just in general blaming me. But the reality is, is the message below says very different from that. Then he links text where Kirstie says, I got upset when you said about Ant-Man because I was like, for fuck's sake, I have work. So it made me realize that I'm just not so available. I was really looking forward to it coming out and missing release day is just such a bummer. I've loved our trips as well and to know I can go like once a year when you love to go places sucks ass. I was just thinking OMG what a boring life I'm going to have just being a receptionist. Like it's alright money but I have no time to do anything because even the weekends I have off I have to come be able to come in if needed. It's also really upset me that I don't have time to gym or anything now. When I went after work it was awful because I had to rush before closing. 
I couldn't even go out after work because I usually get early's after lates and it's just like for fuck's sake when can I actually do anything unless I book holiday. I was looking for actual 9 to 5 jobs with weekends off because apparently there's meant to be loads but there's not. It's not even like you have a job when you go away all day and can't do anything either. So I feel like I can't do anything with you. As you can see here, she was very much upset with the job that she was doing, having no time to do anything. It was upsetting her that she couldn't go to the gym anymore. And this was a big part of her life. The whole thing was being painted out to be absolutely terrible. This message came after she was upset in person because I wanted to go see a film and she couldn't come due to her work getting in the way, which is fine. But she made it clear to me that being in the job she was in was not making her happy. So I sent her this. And then he shows text messages where he says, I was thinking about what you said about not wanting to be in a boring life. I will try my best to help you get out of the 9 to 5 cycle. Just gotta see it as temporary for now and over time we can work finding you something more flexible and fun. I really think streaming can work for you. Especially if you join mine, I could rate your streams, which would send my viewers over at the end of mine. We would just have to work hard on it. When we move, we can really try it. Happy to help with the streaming setup too. She says, that's so sweet you actually thought about it. He says, it was all I thought about on the way home, haha. <laughs> Then he continues his document saying, as you can see, I was trying to be as supportive as possible. And that led to her going into even more detail in the longer message above about how much she hated this job. Now to me personally, I don't think it is fair to frame me in some manipulative way. I was just trying to be a supportive boyfriend. Now in regards to the council tax part, this is a genuine thing I will say sorry for and explain. Pretty much I have had issues with my council tax in the past as I lost my letterbox key and letters of an outstanding council tax bill would go unnoticed. And in this case, I did genuinely believe I had a direct debit created so the tax would automatically go out of my account. And yet for some reason it did not. Kirstie did not include that in her text though taking it out of context. Then he shows a continuation of the text that Kirsty cut off after she said, I can't pay that, where Fraser says, I'll pay it. She says, you said you were sorting it all out when we moved and I'm really confused. She responds, that's why I'm confused. I set up a direct debit. I'll call them in the morning. He continues, I did call them in the morning and the bill was settled. I understand this was a bit of a dumb error on my part, but she suggested this was the reason she could not risk paying her bills, but this happened in mid-November. I asked her to move out in August. These instances are three months apart. Then he posts the text messages that he showed earlier where he asked her to move out of his house. To me personally, this is just more manipulation of the truth. I can understand she may not have trusted me, but there is no need to spin the truth like this. And this just proves that she is trying to lie about literally everything. She also says this, then he shows part of her document where she alleges that he would flex that he can pay for flats and he would hold it against her, along with saying that they had multiple flats. And he says, I mean, this fundamentally isn't true. Yes, there were multiple reasons to why I wanted to move. Uh, not to brag about a nice flat, though. And one of the reasons was so Kirsty could have her own space and room, as confirmed by this text here. And he shows text where he says, I'm constantly thinking about things to make you more comfortable and happy and better for us. I contacted the landlord earlier about moving because I want us to move so we can be in a better place for a multitude of reasons and so you can have your own room. As you can see, another lie from her. And then he posts the part of the allegations where she claims that Fraser broke down for 40 minutes, slammed his fist on the table, and called her disgustingly evil. And he continues saying, here, Kirstie refers to when I had a mental breakdown in the flat. And this did happen. I confirmed this in the document before. But what is being described and what I said here is not true. We had an uncomfortable conversation about people we'd been seeing over the last few months. And even in my message she used, there was no disagreement about the convo not being mutual. We both discussed uncomfortable things. This conversation definitely did not involve me banging my hands on the table or calling her evil. This conversation even ended in a bit of a humorous way from Kirsty here. Then he shows text where it starts off with Fraser saying, Yeah, I was only suggesting it if you really don't want to see any of my friends. Can't imagine Blank being trouble though. Although Blank might stay two days. He stayed at Neutron last time, but I can't keep sleeping there. She says, You don't sleep there. He says, I have slept there a lot lately. Especially when friends stay over. She replies, So you can fuck them, man whore. He says, In an airbed? Contrary to popular belief, you can have multiple friends sleep around and not sleep with them. She says, not you though. He continues, as you can see, she was making jokes about my friends. Whilst looking back on the conversation, it was silly to discuss these things with her. We both were asking each other's questions, and I started to cry and basically got upset at just how messed up everything is in my life. It was a moment of weakness for sure, but given everything you have read so far in this document, I hope you can all understand why I was feeling so fragile in this moment. I didn't shout, but this is a really strange thing to spin too, considering Curse had shouted and cried at me before during the post breakup part of our relationship. I was confiding in a friend about this because it genuinely was making me very worried and concerned about what to do. Then he shows text messages where he sent to a friend where he says, she shouted at me and is crying now. And then it shows a tweet that she made. It got worse. Please, universe, give me a break. And the friend replies, what a horrible person. But let's move on to this part. 
about my claims, I moved her in to get her out of a tough spot. And then he shows her making this claim. This is the very wild claim to make in my opinion, due to the fact that I literally have evidence that her fully moving in was to get her out of that situation. But also before we look at that, notes in those screenshots I say, you live at mine for a bit in the summer. That's very different to completely moving in which albeit I did actually want given the true extent of what was going on in her situation. It starts off with her saying, I really hate this house. And then he says, yeah, that's really understandable, but obviously none of these things are your fault and are just unavoidable things. But like I said last week, if you wanted, you could come to mine and if clear out one of the desks in my office, so you could work in quiet and also be away from your vile housemate. And also if you want to just set up a poll so you don't slack on that, you can. And I know you have social commitments, but taking a week to work is fine. I think you should say yes. Then he says, as you can see, it was very much just trying to get her out of a very tough situation. Yes, the idea of living with my girlfriend was very appealing, so I did keep mentioning it to her, because I wanted her with me and out of a dangerous environment. The fact she has spun yet another thing like this is just so wild to me. I'm genuinely so shocked that she could have taken such an innocent intention and made it out to sound so horrible. Now with the intense part of the relationship towards the beginning, I won't deny me and Kirsty were both very intense with each other. From the very moments we started spending time together, we were basically inseparable. We very much fell in love and this was not a one-way street. Then he links the part of the document that Kirst made, where he sends paragraphs and Kirst alleges that he was obsessed with her. And he says, obviously this DM is very intense. I think I was just scared of losing someone I thought was amazing after some awkward moments and that worried me. I shouldn't have acted like this, but it wasn't like this was one way. Then he shows text messages where Kirst says, when are you coming home? He says like 2 p.m. She says, okay, I miss you. I'm cold. I wish you were here. I miss you. He says, I miss you too. She says, no, like, I miss you for real, proper miss you. He says, you're cute, I miss you too, I'll be there tomorrow. She says, better be. He says, cute. She says, the actual rethought of sleeping without you makes me sick. He continues in his document where he says, now these messages are also from the beginning period of the relationship. Kirsty says, the thought of sleeping without me makes her sick. And yes, she is drunk in these messages, but I think this does just show how intense we both were with each other. I didn't see a problem with it at the time, but now I look back on it and see it as an embarrassing moment that just seems like it's from a teenage relationship. For this, I'm genuinely sorry for acting this way. And now I get to the Kenji chapter. Now I've left this part at the ending due to, due to the amount of screenshots I will be sharing. Kenji is my dog, who at the time of the events was a two to three year old Shiba Inu. Kenji up until the age of two had absolutely no issues bar occasionally barking at a Wii remote. But over in particular the period of 2022, Kenji developed food aggression. And as a result of that, anxiety induced aggression. This genuinely was one of the biggest struggles in the, in the relationship and also my life for the last few years. And I have documented this on social media throughout. I've never hid Kenji's food aggression. Because of Kenji's food aggression, he did start receiving training from a dog trainer. And then he shows texts where he's talking about booking an appointment with a dog trainer. But honestly, I'm not really sure how Kenji's food aggression came to be. But the first incident Kirsty described is true. In March, she was making his food and Kenji was barking, which was a typical thing he used to do. I thought that was him being excited by the idea of food coming, but this is when he bit her leg. And this was an absolutely horrific situation. I'm not going to take away from Kirsty at all that this was genuinely awful and as she said, I apologize to her. Shortly after this, Kenji then did get more training, which I updated on social media after the trainer praised Kenji, showing a tweet that he made in March 16th, 2022, where he says, Kenji saw an expert for his food aggression today and he did very well. The guy said he was one of the best clients. Everyone says, well done, Kenji. Now this was genuinely really good to see and we thought we were making progress. But then as Kirst says, another incident happened when he was guarding her and he tried to attack her when she was in a blanket. At this moment, I was asleep and two doors, multiple walls and a hallway were between us. So I did not hear Kirsty calling for me. This was an extremely difficult situation and I seriously did not know what to do. In April slash March, I decided enough was enough and I decided Kenji needed to be rehomed to someone who could cope better with him. It felt like I was really unable to do anything. So I went into an aggressive dog rehoming group and asked if anyone would be willing to adopt him. Kirst shortly prompted me to delete this post and I understood this came from a caring perspective. She didn't want me to get rid of Kenji for someone I knew for three months. I will always be grateful for this. Now whilst this was a terrible time for Kirsty and me, there has been even more manipulation of the truth in this part and I want to clear that up right now. Then he shows part of the document where she alleges he would ignore the trainer's advice, having Kenji sit on the bed. As you can see, Kenji was on the bed. And this was a rule broken, but this was a rule we both regularly broke multiple times, which Kirsty's own Twitter account even shows. Then he shows a tweet from Kirst in March 2022, where she says Kenji versus sock and shows Kenji playing with a sock with her. This is Kenji on the bed. Photos taken by Kirst. There were moments we both skipped out on his training for a little moment, but in the screenshots below, you will see confirmation of how much we were trying with him. Then he shows messages where he says, same, we have literally done everything. She replies that boy takes over our lives. 
He says, crate training is the only thing. And she says, it's annoying about him getting upset at the kitchen again, though. Like, that feels like a million steps back. As you can see, Kirsty here claims it's a million steps back, after Kenji displayed a few issues again, and how he has taken over our lives. We were clearly trying everything we both could to help. Then he attaches more text messages where he says, he was apologetic because it ran off and attacked my dog only because he was training it. It's not his fault and he is clearly a good owner as I always see him training the dog. Then they reply, dog shouldn't be off the lead if it runs off and attacks though. And he says, only person who got injured was me, haha. -ha. He continues saying, but there were more instances when Kinji was attacked by a larger dog when on a training session. As you can see, he was wearing his training lead in this photo. This was what the trainer at the time recommended. But we did think we were getting somewhere because the trainer's training actually did start to help and the advice he gave me to implement on the Kenji actually did start to display results. Then he shows pictures of Kenji eating and says, his food aggression is basically gone now. W? She replies, I'm actually really happy to hear it. I was worried about him, but he seems a lot better. And Kirsty seems a lot calmer too. In this scene here with a friend from April 2022, this is me doing training with Kenji. And he was displaying clear signs that his food aggression had gone. Previously, Kenji would be aggressively protective over his food, but now he would allow me to take the food and sit down and wait for it patiently. I think me and Kirstie at this point genuinely thought that we were getting somewhere with him, and after this, there were really no moments until the one in 2023. Yes, he still clearly had anxiety and was not allowed in the kitchen due to the fact that for some reason, Kenji developed a fear of kitchens. But it was clear progress was being made, and whilst I'm not using this to take away from the awful incident in 2023, I want this to show that I really did try with Kenji. Yes, there were moments where I led him on the bed when he shouldn't have been, but we both put everything we had done into helping him, and that led to so many posts by Curtis herself claiming her love for Kenji, showing a post she made on TikTok. Here's a TikTok of her saying he stole her heart and that she would give her life for him. Here are more loving photos of Kenji posted by Kirsty, and more photos that she put on TikTok. Here are even more, and here where he shows even more, even with photos of him on the bed, despite the criticism towards me for letting him on the bed, and shows one right here from February 2023, and another one from January 24th, 2023, and even more of them. Now, the reason I'm posting these here isn't to justify anything. What Kenji did was absolutely horrific, but it is to show how we genuinely did try our best with Kenji, and we honestly did think that he was getting better. Hence, so many positive posts like this. Then he shows another TikTok and says, as you can see, the caption says, she is out here living her best life, and this is the first time she's genuinely felt happy and content in a long time. Even more TikToks in July 2022 stating Kenji is her son, and the caption is a joke about just wanting to talk about Kenji. And then he shows that right here. Again, this shows things were getting better. Even to the point of in October 2022, we had enough confidence in Kenji's behavior getting better and had him learning that we left him at a sitter's so we could go on a trip to New York City. This photo is just in reference to us being in New York. As you can see, Kenji had gotten to the point of being able to be happy around other dogs, indoors and outdoors, off the lead. We really did think progress is being made, and this came from all of the training and determination that we put in showing pictures of Kenji hanging out with other dogs. Now we get into the incident of April 2023, where Kenji bit Kirstie again. And this was just an absolutely awful incident. To this day, I hate looking back on it as it's just such a horrific thing. But again, in this document, it's pinned on me like this was almost my doing by stating I slammed the door. This was not true. Whilst I do remember being annoyed at work, this would usually never cause Kenji to react in an aggressive way. He usually gets very anxious when he hears storms or even rain. But what I do remember is hearing Kirsty shout and running in the room to find Kenji biting Kirsty's arm and I ran and pulled him off of her. We then went to A&E and Kirsty mentions that I was on the phone and tweeting whilst consoling me, showing her saying that in the document. The thing is, me and Kirsty were both tweeting at this point. I was in shock and we were sat in A&E waiting. Because Kirst made tweets, I wanted to alert people about what was going on. Then he shows tweets where Kirst starts saying, Kenji randomly attacked me. I've got 20 plus pictures, but these are the worst four in the ones. I've got 20 plus pictures about it. I got a tetanus shot last year. Then one where she says, I know people mean well, but the amount of people that have said we need to get Kenji a behavior list and try to put him on medication is infuriating because we've done all of that. Makes me feel like people don't think we have done absolutely everything we can to help him. And another one where she says, thank you. I just feel so deflated now because I've had a bunch of people blame me and say I'm the cause. Like they know Kenji personally or how we deal with him. Most people have been kind, but OMG does it suck getting blamed when I'm not the reason. Because of these tweets, I made tweets myself. We were both devastated and we were both consoling each other. I was genuinely in a state of shock, and to be honest, to this day with that incident, I still am. It is absolutely a horrific event that I wish never happened. I want to clear up the whole part about making her speak to the vet. I called up the vet, 
but I thought it would be appropriate for her to speak and tell the vets everything about what happened. The reason I thought this is because this was a serious event and obviously the conversation surrounding getting Kendry put down was now happening. I wanted this to be done properly, seeing as Kirstie was the one who it happened to and that I wasn't in the room. I felt it should be Kirstie to tell her story because I was in the other room. I wanted everything to be completely accurate and also I didn't want to just instinctively just try to think of ways to defend the actions. This was a horrible time in my life and only a couple months before I almost lost my dad due to a stroke and the thought of losing Kenji too was very hard so I wanted to do it properly. It might sound confusing but I just really thought it best to get Kenji's story to the vet and not a story that might not be 100% accurate as I wasn't there. As much as what Kenji had done was terrible, I wanted to treat this carefully as I knew this most likely would have led to him being put down. Then he shows another part of her document where he makes a tweet about the worst part being that Kenji was really excited to see them and that he feels bad. This tweet was poor wording, I won't deny it, and I am so sorry for that. That was on the night of the incident, and there was genuinely something so horrible about seeing Kenji all excited to have us back and not acting like anything had happened. The worst part of it was, of course, Kirsty getting bit. I should have not worded that tweet that way. Then he shows a post that he made on April 2023 where he tries to get Kenji rehomed. On the day of the incident, I also made a post on the rehoming page for aggressive dogs. I intended for Kenji to go at this moment. I was more expecting him to be put down, but we had to wait for the decision from the vets, which came a few days. After we went to the vet with Kenji, we spoke to them for a while, and at this point, I was honestly under the impression that there was no helping him whatsoever, and he was going to die. But then, when we got into the vets, they did give us the option of putting Kenji down, but also the option of a very expensive special veterinary clinic, where a specially educated high-class veterinarian trainer would come and analyze Kenji and work out all of his issues whilst also giving him scans for anything possible underlying. They also then provided me with contact details of people who could then take after Kenji after he had received this training if I still felt it was best. And honestly, at this point, I started to think maybe there would be another chance of life for Kenji. Somewhere better he could go where he would be in an environment that would make him happy and no longer anxious. And with this offer given to me, I absolutely could not put him down. I had multiple people tell me it would be irresponsible to just put him down in the moment, knowing that there was a chance at life. And I also had the idea that instead of Kenji living with me and Kirsty in the flat we reside at, he could live in my office, which was only around the corner from where we lived. It was our previous home converted into an office. And because of that, I knew that he would have a comfortable living space whilst having this training and then eventually get rehomed. Kirst was angry with me because it gave her the impression that I was going to get him put down, but also in this time period I was very depressed and not knowing what to do. I tried being there as much as I could, but going in one room and seeing the dog I thought I was going to kill, and then Kirsty, who was dealing with so much, it was just horrible. Then he shows text messages where he says, look, I'm not going to argue with you over this. My reasoning for not having him put down was a moral conscious decision. The vet gave me options and after speaking to them about the cruelty of the places, she told me they're not like that and explained a lot to me as she has personal experience there. I told you that he wouldn't be in your space, he'd be in a different building until he's gone, and if he isn't gone, he would be put down any anyway. But you don't want that and fair enough. I don't know why you keep acting like I'm keeping him blank. When I'm not doing that, he is nowhere what you. But this is my reasoning. It was a much more difficult decision in my eyes than the easy route of just killing him. But I would not be able to live with myself if I didn't try my best to find the right spot for him. I'm sorry if I emotionally don't deal with things the best, but it's not really an easy thing. And then being given the choice within 30 minutes of either killing my dog or remaining with you without regards to that other stuff. That also made it hard. So I'm sorry you disagree, but this was my choice. I was given basically a 10 minute timer to decide when I sat outside the vets what I was going to do that day. Put down Kenji or try to give him a better life. On that day, we broke up. Now Kenji did eventually get to scene too and even got his own training guide. Then he shows an email confirming that. And from that point, he had other slots where he saw the experts too. And since then, there have been zero issues with Kenji. I was actively trying to find a place for Kenji to be rehomed in, but found no suitable places. So I decided to keep on working with Kenji. He stayed most of the time at my office with me. But if he came to our living flat, he would usually always be in the room that I'm in. But based on the images below, Kirstie was okay with this even appoints letting Kenji in her bed and posting him on her story. Then he shows text messages where he says, what was it? And the friend responds, Kirsty is posting Kenji on her story again. And more messages where he shows a picture of Kenji. I think he wants to see you. And then an image that's not loaded in. And he says, what a creep. He's creeped over to you after being kicked out from my bed. And they say, you've upset him. And more pictures of Kenji on the bed. And more text messages where she says, did you put him in a room? He replies, in the bedroom, I thought. In an image that's not loaded and her saying, he was scratching at the door when I was opening it. Has he been alone long? He replies, nice butt, Kenji. Like two hours. 
She says, okay, I'll play with him for a bit so he doesn't feel lonely. He doesn't want to play, he just wants cuddles. I'm not using these to score points, more to explain the timeline of what happened with Kenji after everything. I understand that a lot of people think because of Kenji's history that Kenji should be put down, but knowing there was another possible chance for him made me think that I just could not do it. I get it if you would have took a different decision, but given how much better he is now, I am glad I took the decision. This part of the document really isn't here as an expose, but is more here to document that this whole thing was so much more difficult. We both loved and cared for Kenji, which she does say in her document. And I will always be grateful for her for putting up with him and telling me not to rehome in 2022. Then he says, but yes, that basically concludes disproving everything here. My relationship with Kersey had many problems, but what she has claimed in her document is disgusting and I'm in shock that she could even publish such allegations about me. I hope she retracts them, and we can both go about our lives in separate ways. I really hate airing out all private information to the world to dispel horrible rumors, but because of her two posts, I now have to. Please, if you could spread this document whilst her verse remains up, but please do not harass anybody. Then he posts an edit where he says, I also want to add that I think the situation needs to be absolutely re-diverted to the original situation, Alice. Please support and uplift her. What happened with me was a toxic and really messy relationship, and I think any logical person can understand that two exes living together in such an uncomfortable situation will always lead to toxic behavior, but there is a strong difference between having disagreements and doing what happened to Alice. I think everyone who's been in a long-term relationship has had moments where they've been rude or not acted in the best possible way in every scenario, and honestly it would be very easy to spin anything about anyone. This is where we need to actually be serious about this stuff, and realize that this situation I am now sadly involved in takes away from real victims. This shouldn't be about me or Kirsty. This should be private. The fact that I am having to air out even more private information to defend myself is so mentally draining. She stated at the beginning of the document that she did not want to make this information public, yet she started this situation when she made a thread about me, deleted it, and then made another thread accusing me of being not that far off of Alex. Then he shows a message from Tuesday where she says, please do not contact me. As you can see from the screenshot above, I wanted to resolve this privately, but she told me to not contact her after I messaged her. But after she took down her original thread, she made the second one, which I disproved, and now the third one, which I now have disproved. I just want this situation to end. I am more than happy to delete these documents and write it off as a bad week that can be forgotten of, but I expect more DMs are going to be spun into painting a picture that doesn't match the original situation. Couples argue. Couples have rights and things can get messy. You could read or listen to our arguments and probably each time change what you think is who you think is in the right because that's just what happens in arguments. Even when I had a mental breakdown in front of her, I regret that and I think it was stupid of me. But for it to be spun into anything else shows that literally anything here is going to be spun into anything and probably become an endless cycle of back and forth. I don't want to respond anymore. The situation could just end here, but I doubt it will. Thanks to everyone for your support. Obviously, this is a really tough time, and I personally do not want to be on social media for at least a week, as I literally, about five minutes after this document, found out from my dad a very sad personal situation in my family has happened. The reason I mention this is to say, if it seems like I'm ignoring any of you, I am not. I'm already struggling to mourn due to everything that's been happening this week, and my mind genuinely just feels broken after so much. I just want to take time away and grieve. Yet sadly, it doesn't really feel possible. As I am experiencing anxiety-induced panic attacks, constantly checking my phone worried about what's going to be spun next and how long I'm going to have to spend disproving things. This has been a horrible week but thank you for your support and sorry if I seem unresponsive for a while. Fraser. Now to be completely honest I think Fraser's closing statements are absolutely perfect along with basically like 95% of what he put in the document. There are some things here and there that I just slightly disagree with but even the things I might slightly disagree with him on I don't think that Cursed's framing is fair in any way shape and form. I think 100% of the document is unfair from Cursed. I think he did an amazing job with this document. He absolutely cleared his name. I mean he's openly admitting that he did a lot of stupid things in the relationship which is fine. I mean you know there's no hate there. I'm not giving him hate but also showing that she is just a complete liar in basically every single way, which is just disgusting. I mean, she should be completely ashamed of herself. But obviously, she's not ashamed of herself because she went on a crazy Twitter episode where she just tweeted a whole fuck ton of things in response to this document. Yep, I'm still scrolling. Yep, still scrolling. Okay, holy fuck. And I'm just going to read her response as well because fuck it. At this point, whatever. Might as well get it all out there. She says, last time I'm speaking about this because what the fuck? That screenshot of me claiming that I was coercing him into sex when I don't even ask him for sex and I'm just asking a question where you can clearly see I was insecure. He told me the day that we broke up that it was the reason and it played in my mind for months. He's cropped sexual texts and us joking together to make me look worse where I never coerced him into sex. The second one was when from he undressed me and was teasing me to make me beg for him and then he didn't again why I said I think we are thinking of different times. 
These people just love run on sentences, bro. It's it's unreadable. I've been open about being a sexual person and being a sub online. Having him use my kinks against me and our sex life is proof it is fucking wild and clutching at straws. No, Fraser didn't physically harm me, and I admit to that in my doc. I literally talked about him trying to pressure me into sex and haven't claimed it to be assault. That text he is using to claim he didn't have me shut in the room for hours and stopped telling me proves I didn't lie. He did shut me in there for hours and he did stop telling me. What do you mean the one where you guys are like teasing each other and I've been sat here like a lemon with a whole bunch of crying emojis and laughing emojis? Is this really the abuse that this is what we're living as abuse? I'm, I'm, I'm honestly done. I'm done. That I'm not even going to read this. If you guys want to read it, it's on her Twitter page, but I can't even be asked. I'm over this. This woman is ridiculous. Fuck this shit. I followed her in case she went private, but I'm done with this woman. Fuck this.